Welcome to the Black Writers Studio, a podcast presented by the Hurston Wright Foundation and hosted by Dr. Khadija Ali Coleman. The Black Writers Studio is dedicated to showcasing Black writers who are transforming the world today with their literary pen and creating a legacy for the culture. Natasha Gordon Chippenbear is author of the book Representation and Black Womanhood, The Legacy of Sarah Bartman, and the historical fiction novel Finding La Nagrita. Her work has been featured in Essence magazine, along with a monthly series, Musings from an Afro-Costa Rican in the Tico Times. She is a senior co-editor of the Afro-Latino book series from Palgrave, and her current writing focuses on slavery and the legacy of Afro-descendants in Latin America. Born in New York to Costa Rican Panamanian parents, she eventually moved to Costa Rica eight years ago with her husband and two children. She is the founder and host of the annual Tango Said writing retreats in Costa Rica, a week-long exclusive gathering of global BIPOC writers. Wonderful. So, so Dr. Natasha, I, um, I asked you earlier offline to tell me where you are because I know that we have um, a different, we're in different time zones. So can, can you give me a little um, backstory on where you are and how, and what led you to where you are right now? Absolutely. Thank you. So I'm in Costa Rica and <laughs> I've been living here for about almost eight and a half years with my husband and two children. Okay. And so my mother's Costa Rican, my father's Panamanian. I was born in Brooklyn, New York. So shout out to Brooklyn. Yeah. And um, I was a professor at CUNY for many years. And um, right at the end of, I would say, Obama's presidency, my husband and I sort of took a temperature check about where the country was going. And we knew based on our historical knowledge of sort of what happens with blackness and then black success and black excellence and then what happened sort of in the world with with that when it happened sort of what the backlash was so we anticipated something like Trump coming um and thinking about even looking at history Jim Crow and reconstruction and all that and so an opportunity came for for us to move to Costa Rica um I had a chance to do some research which eventually turned into my historical fiction novel Finding La Negrita but we really were driven by the idea that we wanted to raise our black children in a place that was safe. And so I have a large extended family in Costa Rica. I'm in the Central Valley. Um, We really led with the idea that our children um, would tell us, right? So we, we tried it for a year and then had a discussion. But after a year, they were so happy. Um, you know, Costa Rica doesn't have an army. So the mentality around just the random violence and guns and shooting, it, it's just not part of the air. It's not part of a conversation um, that, that kids have. It's not, you know, you don't give kids gifts that have guns. Uh, you're not going to find that on the shelves here. And so it was a, a different type of childhood for them. And they are totally fluent in Spanish now, which is the perk, right, of coming into this country. Um, Um, and learning that. And we are incredibly grateful. You know, next year we'll be empty nesters. So it will be a different part of our lives. You know, our son went off to college in Canada. My daughter's waiting for her college acceptances. She's also thinking about going to Canada. And, you know, we're just, we're, we're thinking about, you know, what next in terms of life in Costa Rica, but it's been really beautiful so far. Wow, that's so fascinating. For a second, I forgot. I, I host. A, um, I'm an education scholar, so for a second, I w- I was going to start delving into that because this is so fascinating. Just everything that you said, and I think when I was speaking with you earlier, I didn't get the impression that you had been there for almost a decade. So that definitely has colored um, your lens as a writer, I'm sure, um, and even the things that you've shared already as a thinker, because you've been able to now do some comparison and some contrast. So I would love to know 
in what ways, you know, jump in where you want. You can start where you want in terms of um, sharing about your writing journey, but I would love to know how this stay right now in Costa Rica has really um, transformed or impacted your writerly life. And then we can start to jump into talking a little bit about La Negrita. I love that concept of the writerly life. So that was one of the commitments. My husband's a professional musician. And so we actually met in South Africa 26 years ago. So we have traveled, you know, we've done all that. Right. Um, and I'm, I'm a formally trained professor of African diasporic literature and writing. And I've been doing, I've been in the classroom for over 20 years. And so... <clears throat> When I was small, I always said that I wanted to be a writer and I was very inspired and people laugh at this. I was very inspired by Little Women um, by Louisa May Alcott and people have all kinds of issues with it. But I, but growing up as a child of immigrant parents from Central America via Jamaica, right? So it was very Caribbean in terms of my, uh, my upbringing in Brooklyn. Um, the only spaces that I could go were, were those that included books. So the library was a popular space you know, in school. I mean, that's sort of what my immigrant parents really, you know, made clear that that was a priority for us. So by five, I wanted to be Jo March, right? That was the character that I really identified with, that she sacrificed all these things in order to write. And it, no matter what happened, she'd cut her hair, she'd do all these things right. for her family, but really she wanted to get to the page and the word. Right. And so I have always known that. And as a as a scholar of literature, you know, I went onto the path that that I loved. But it was so I have had an academic career that has produced, you know, academic text articles, conferences, like yeah, I mean, just the sort of the gamut of what would happen um, as a tenured professor, right? And then uh, but I've never had the opportunity to actually write fiction in a way that um that I wanted to. It's like, you know, as, a, as, as sort of somebody in academia, there's not really a lot of space for that. Right. And so in coming to Costa Rica, one of the things that I committed to, to myself and, and my husband and I, you know, we spoke about this, that we wanted to be more intentional about our creativity, mm. right? And so in coming here, it was sort of like, okay, well, we're creating this whole new life from scratch in many ways. And how are we going to incorporate or make central the creative impulse, right? And as a musician, that was really clear for him. He was sort of on that path already. But for me, it was a challenge because originally I was thinking about um, writing almost like a, a historical text on the Afro-descendant presence of, of um, enslaved and free Africans in colonial Costa Rica. That was originally my take, right? Thinking about these people who were here from the 17th century, Costa Rica had 200 years of slavery and uh, they did not have a cash crop. So in many cases, it was sort of different types of slavery, cattle ranching on the cacao farm, but mostly domestic, meaning in the capital of Cartago, you had many enslaved people, but there was also a community of free Black people, you know, and a lot of people don't think about those those nuances of freedom, right? And so I was really thinking about that, but also thinking about Costa Rica today, which presents itself as sort of the Switzerland of Central America. It is, I mean, there's nothing you can get, not get in Costa Rica, like literally, mm -hmm. uh, except, except Trader Joe's is not here yet and Target's not here yet. When, when they start bringing in some Tabitha Brown stuff from Target, I'll be like, okay, Costa Rica, <laughs> where am I living? But right. at this moment, those are essentially the only two things that you cannot get here. And one of the things that I was thinking about was, okay, you have this country that is sort of looks to sort of has a U.S., white U.S. capitalistic values and certainly Spanish values, right, in terms of how they, they're, they're mestizo, meaning they're mixed, right, mm -hmm. most Costa Ricans, but many of them are white presenting. Right. And they understand that and particularly the level of wealth um, Costa Rica has. Like, I mean, there are very wealthy Costa Ricans here. Mm -hmm. And so in, in this sort of presentation of this country that's eco friendly, that, you know, it has really done incredible things for the environment. It's a small country, less than five million people. I wanted to understand how they reconcile this sort of white identity 
with veneration of a Black Madonna, right? So 92% of the, co- the, the country is Catholic, and essentially they all worship the Black Madonna, La Negrita, the little Black one, which mm. is a Black, uh, a, a, an icon, um, a tiny stone um, of, um, of the Virgin Mary and child that's in the Basilica, which is the biggest cathedral in Costa Rica, and she's the patron saint of the country. So that's sort of my writerly journey in the sense of I was trying to figure out, well, how does this white facing a white presenting country understand its veneration to this black Madonna? And in the process, what I come to, came to realize was that there's sort of a disconnect, right? And so my job as a scholar, but also as a writer was to figure out how to make those connections and particularly to think about the people who were free during that time period of African descent. And so that's what that's that's what took me to my book. I mean, it took me seven years to write it, mm-hmm. right? Because it's, it's all deeply researched. I mean, I went to the British Library, the National Archives in Costa Rica. I got documents from Guatemala. I mean, it was a lot of historical work. But then what I realized was that even though it was historical, it didn't give me the humanity of the African people that I wanted to really delve into. I wanted to hear their voices. And so for me, historical fiction, which is my favorite genre of reading, I felt like, okay, well, because I have all this sort of historical foundation, I could then have the creative freedom and the license to kind of bring it all together. And that's what happened. That's fantastic. And you explained it so um, vividly yet succinctly. I appreciate that. And I, so it leads me to ask about this story, this hum- huma- humane story, this story that harkens back to um, pre-slavery, really for these characters and showing their, you know, their experiences or um, the impact of the Middle Passage. Can you tell me a little bit about um, why these characters and how they they were developed or are they based on any of the historical figures that you came across in your research prior to deciding to do fiction? <laughs> right. Um, well, I found a listing in the National Archives of Costa Rica of prominent um Costa Rican, well, current Costa Rican, but I would say uh, colonial, Spanish colonial families that listed their property, including their cattle, their slaves, their enslaved people. Like, I mean, you know, it was like a log. And so I absolutely knew that these particular families existed. It was well documented. And so from there, with that particular evidence, I was able to imagine, you know, how many people lived in different homes. Costa Rica was not a wealthy country. Um, It was seen as sort of a backwater country because they could not compete with Brazil during that time. They didn't have a cash crop, right? And so even though they, they they farmed cacao and they were cattle ranching. It still, they did not have a lot of money. And at one point, cacao um, was actually used as currency because they didn't have they didn't have silver. Wow. Um, but so, in thinking about um, this, these characters, they just showed up. And I know people say, "Oh, are they a composite?" They're not a composite of of anyone. I mean, these, the first character that shows up for me is Dakara, and he is um, a Zimbabwean who is a sculptor, and he specifically works on Shona sculptor. sculpture. Now, I've been to Zimbabwe, you know, I mean, and I love the Shona sculpture, so I love the stone. I, I had engaged with artists when I was there, so these places in Africa that I wrote about prior, you know, prior to the Middle Passage and then arriving in Costa Rica um, are authentic spaces, right? And so it's not like make-believe. I've been in these spaces. And so I can easily sort of reproduce them in the same way that when I was in Costa Rica, I went to Cartago, which was a former colonial capital, and walked the city and looked at old maps and went to the museum. And, and I, 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 I engaged in the space that way. And that's how I, um, I translate that into creating the world that, that I did because it's set in 1634. And that's a pretty long time ago, mm-hmm. right? Um, and so all of these characters, like there were four main characters and they all showed up. And so I believe that they just needed their stories told. That's that's fascinating. I I, um, I even find it um, interesting how 
it gives context to slavery outside of what we know um, as those born in, in the United States of um, when we we think of, um, and I mean, I'll speak for myself, you know, we have these DNA tests, ancestry.com, what have you. Um, and a lot, you know, a lot of, depending on where you're located in the United States, we're finding that there were certain places in West Africa where your ancestors may have um, hearkened from when they were captured and brought here. And I know a lot of Nigerian, you know, my ancestry is majority Nigeria, Nigeria, Benin. Um, but then when your character from Zimbabwe, and I had um, previously done a educational travel in Colombia and learned that a lot of the people from that formed the Palenques were from different countries, but um, a lot of them were taken from Ghana. And so your story just gives context to just how that entire West Coast of Africa was just um, attacked and, and mm -hmm. the people that were captured. And I just find that so fascinating. In your research, did you find, um, was there any predominant group of people from Western Africa, a, a country in Western Africa, where folks were brought from there to Costa Rica in particular um, from your studies? Well, um, most of the Africans, so let me say this, let me backtrack a little bit. Costa Rica did not have an auction space or a, a slave port. The really? closest, Yes, they did not. So Costa Rica never imported, like never had ships and they were never involved because they were so poor. They were right. never directly involved in the slave trade. But okay. what they did was they acquired enslaved people through Panama in the South, because Panama and Portobello was the largest slave port in that region. Mm -hmm. So you would have Spaniards going up and down the coast and they would get small numbers of enslaved people because the terrain was, I mean, Costa Rica's terrain is very mountainous, it's very dense. And so many of them could not withstand the dengue and the malaria and all this. Right. And so you ended up having smaller numbers. And that's why I would say um, there weren't many people from directly from Africa, like directly from the slave trade that came into Costa Rica, what ended up happening was you had people who were already American in the sense that they had been born in the Americas already. So someplace in Latin America, they had already been born, possibly even worked on a plantation. And then they were traded up and down the coast of both the Pacific and the, and the Caribbean on the Atlantic side um, of Latin America, right? And so that's kind of where you find... So there were already people who had learned Spanish already and who had been sort of enslaved and then they were brought and sold and then brought into the interior or to the capital of, of Cartago at that time. But I would say that from my book, what I did was I used um, the Angolan slave trade, right? And we'd know that with the Angolan slave trade, that, would, that went prim predominantly to Brazil, which would make sense that those people went to Brazil and then moved up and down that coast um, and then, you know, fed into different parts of Central America where slavery was very much, you know, part of the day. That's fascinating. When, when you, so La Negrita came out fall 2022 and right now, um, you know, you're you're doing your your tour and letting folks know about it. What is something in particular that you want um, folks to walk away knowing uh, um, upon reading this book? It, you've invested so much time, um, the research, the creative, um, emotional labor. What is it that you want readers to take away after reading your book? Mm, that's a beautiful question. I think there are a couple of things. So one, I would, I really wanted this book to be part of a conversation of, um, of people understanding that slavery did exist in Costa Rica, both nationally, but, but globally, but particularly regionally, right? Because many people don't understand that there was actually slavery. When they think of Afro-Costa Ricans, they think of the, the Jamaican and Barbadian and Bahamian immigrants who came at the turn of the 20th century to work for the United Fruit Company, right? It's the same people who went to work for the, for the Panama Canal, right? And so those are already people who were emancipated from the Caribbean who came and bought Caribbean culture. They were, or they were immigrants, but they came to the, to the Atlantic coast. But 
on the Pacific coast and in the Central Valley, Costa Rica did have slavery for 200 years. And in the process, there had to have been some sort of legacy and impact. So one of the things I really wanted was for my book to sort of enter this conversation of Afro-descendant legacy and heritage as part of the region, right? When we see now that different countries are even adding um, these kind of markers to census, right? So people can kind of identify differently with their blackness now when in the past, these weren't even options, right? So these kinds of conversations are, are important. And I think that, you know, I'm hoping that that book, that the book does that because many people don't think about Costa Rica and blackness. Right. Like they, they don't, they don't line it up, right? right. Um, and I'm just saying, yes, blackness has been here for a very long time right. and has developed, you know, enslaved people built the colonial capital and, right. and all these structures. And so we need to think about their legacy and, and acknowledge and respect what they've done in investing in creating this nation state. Um, I, so that's one thing. And then I guess the other thing I wanted people to take away was the fact that even in the spaces of deep oppression, slavery, Mm -hmm. um, colonization. Mm -hmm. We can love and love is revolutionary. So this is a love story too, by the way. <laughs> so right, that's, right. so I really wanted to, you know, I mean, and that's what I, that's what I really wanted to do with this book. I wanted to get into the interior of these lives and show how people make decisions in the face of freedom or enslavement, but in, in the face of their own humanity and thinking about choices that people have to make on the everyday and in the process, how they make sacrifices for love, whether it's, you know, a father and his daughter, whether it's, a, you know, a man and a woman, whether it's a community having to love and get together for themselves, whether it's taking care of an elder, whether all of these different types of relationships are based in an understanding of community and love. And I really wanted to center that. That sounds beautiful because um, I think that we don't hear about those very human engagements and relationships when we even think about enslavement. Um, and and I, I know that, you know, I've heard folks say that we don't need another film on slavery. We don't need another book on slavery. Um, or we need, uh, if we're going to talk about slavery, we need to talk about um, the revolts or, you know, the people who are separated, like the um, Maroons or the Palenque, right? But when you speak of love, I think that that in itself is a, a rebellion that's rebellious in itself during that time. And for people to even be able to trace their history, um, that's rebellious um, in knowing your where you've descended from when you've had this type of treachery happen. Um, to our ancestors. I think that one of the things that is really um, profound to me is how you center religion. Um, knowing, you know, you, the title is even the Black Madonna, you know, La Negrita, uh, Finding La Negrita. I, I wanted to know, did you have to, in your research, in focusing or centering, because that's a very real artifact, when mm -hmm. you said it's in the Basilica, did you have to also um, look at the ways that um, African descendant people had to still be able to hold on to their religious and spiritual spiritual um, deities in the face of Christianity really replacing a lot of their culture? How did that show up in your research and then find its way into your book? Right. Thank you. And it's really interesting because finding La Negrita, really, the idea is finding as in journey. Right. Mm -hmm. And so in many cases, um, the the journey of finding the icon really comes at the end of the book. It's sort of part of the climax and no spoilers. Right, right, um, right. <laughs> right. But one, I guess the thing that shows up for me, it's not these African descended people are not participating in Catholicism. Right. So they are not they're not embracing the religion. They have their own understandings of practices, traditional medicine, everything else. The, um, so religion, the way that religion, I would say Catholicism shows up in this text, and it, it's not it's not a nice it's not a nice one. It's an indictment. Right. Because when we understand, if you look at the historical documents and go into archives, the Catholic Church was one of the largest owners of enslaved people during this time period. And the benefits of that labor 
um, are never discussed. And so one of the central characters and probably one of the most powerful characters in the book is Esmeralda. And she is a slave, an enslaved woman owned by the Catholic church. Mm -hmm. And so that is sort of where religion played, like the power of the church in the everyday negotiations of, of, of how this enslaved woman is dealt with. And then her own form of sort of maroonage that happens in this journey. Uh, so I think that in terms of religion, absolutely. Um, and it's really only towards the end of the book that the icon um, is officially recorded in sort of, you know, this space then becomes a venerated space. But I would say that um, in terms of the, the enslaved people and the free black people during that time period, they were not engaged in Catholicism in that way, even though the performances of Catholicism by the Spaniards were very present. And so I wrote that definitely into the text, you know, from the rosaries to confession to, I mean, all of those things, because I, you know, growing up, I attended Catholic school, right? And so these are things that are not, these are not un unfamiliar things to me. Like I know those performances and rituals so I was able to authentically write those things into the text. That's fantastic. And I think that um, that adds another layer of, it's just a lot that the book um, sounds like it's, it's giving the reader in terms of the historical dimension, the human element with the love story, the journey, but also really this reckoning of, you know, coming to terms with these institutions that still exist and their involvement in a lot of um, the history that is, is, is terrible. The things that folks are not so proud to really admit or to really give um, attention to. And it sounds like you, you bravely include this in your book. So I, I can talk to you forever because I have so many questions. And I, I even said prior to um, us coming together that I wanted to ask you about um, Sarke, Sarah Bartman, um, mm -hmm. the South African woman who many um, have referred to in the past as Venus Hottentot. I wanted to um, just n get an idea of where do you go after this book? Finding La Nagrita um, is so rich, so heavily um, substantive. Where do you go from here in terms of what do you want to see as your next creative venture? Because it seems like this is really at the top of your priorities is really being able to actualize this creative, creative energy. I know it is soon the, the book just dropped, but what do you want to see for this book? And what do you oh. want to see after this book? Well, I always say my mantra, and this is what I've told my editor, I was like, Netflix and Oprah, that's what I want for this book. Because, I mean, movies are filmed all the time. I want a limited series on Netflix for the book, and that is what I'm putting out in the universe. And I want to have the book picked up by Oprah's Book Club, and why can't I dream, right? Yes. And so <laughs> and let's manifest it, right? Let's, man let's manifest it and put it out <laughs> in the world. And so um, this book is doing quite well. What's, what's really nice is that folks are starting to teach it, like for the spring semester, um, Yale Divinity School's doing it, Stony Brook, Brown University. So lots of schools are, start, you know, people are really, really interesting. I'm uh, interested. I know that folks in Michigan are interested. And so they're starting to teach it. And so I'm doing a lot of different Zoom speaking engagements with classrooms. And that is just fantastic for me. Um, in terms of the next project, I already started. I have another book called Na uh, Naomi, and it is based on the Caribbean coast of Costa Rica, Puerto Limon. And it is, <coughs> excuse me, a uh, are very loose, very, very, very loose um, retelling of my great grandmother's life. And her name was Ruth, so you can understand the biblical references to Naomi. Um, and so one of the things that I wanted to do, so I have been studying particularly Marcus Garvey and his influence in, in Puerto Limon because you know he first came from Jamaica to work for the United Fruit Company mm -hmm. um, in Puerto Limon. That was his first stop. And so we still have a UNIA office. Um, mm -hmm. The Black Cross nurses were here. I mean, there's this whole rich community and I'm very actually involved in that community today. Wow. Um, we just celebrated about 
Two weeks ago, we just celebrated the 150th anniversary of the landing of the first ship in 1872 that, that landed in Puerto Limon that brought over the first 126 workers from Jamaica. Wow. 123 men and three women who came to work for the United Fruit Company and the Northern Railroad Company. Um, and so we just had a big celebration in Puerto Limon and there's lots of archival um, work that's being done where we're tracing all these families, Caribbean, Afro-Caribbean families, we're tracing the lineage now and they're doing this big exhibit and it's online. And so it's an incredible project, literally documenting 150 years of generations of people who are currently Afro Costa Ricans, but essentially their people all come from the Caribbean. So I have been doing that research for years because it's part of my own family history. Right. And so, so it's going to be another historical fiction text um, that hopefully will won't take me another seven years. <laughs> <laughs> right? Um, I'll be an empty nester in the in the fall, and yeah. so we will see. Um, and I, you know, I'm just doing the research right now, actually, and I'm just reading and writing, taking notes, and jotting out chapters. And so I'm enjoying, obviously, the life of finding La Negrita because it's still very new. I'm really excited to think about or to listen to what students have to say about it. That's mm -hmm. that I, I'm really excited to talk to students and then begin this process of this next book, Naomi. Oh, that's fantastic. So so tell folks where they can get your book, where you would like for them to stop to get your book online or in person. Um, okay, so outside of Costa Rica, in Costa Rica, they can get it at Semicolon Books, which is an English language bookstore in Escazú, which is in the Central Valley. And if they want physical copies, they're in country. But if not, then all the regular spaces for Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, uh, my press, which is Jaded Ibis Press, also has a link where you can buy it directly from them. And yeah, that's where folks can buy the book. And you you can buy hard copies or e-copies. Wonderful. Are you on social media or anywhere where folks can reach out to you? Absolutely. So I have an Instagram account that I would love for folks to follow me. I post reels and just information about the book and different speaking engagements. It is my full name, Natasha Gordon Chippenberry. And um, I also am on Facebook. Wonderful. Well, it's been a pleasure um, to meet you, to hear about your wonderful book, um, your your research. You're definitely an inspiration to those of us who consider ourselves multi-genre writers and also scholars as well as creatives. So I just, I, I enjoyed our conversation. I just wish you the best and happy new year to you. Thank you so much. Happy new year. Wonderful.